More by Gunther Geltinger Translator Alexander Booth 1. Autumn No one speaks here. There, where you are listening, only water, alder trees, wind pulling at the rushes. The fog too is soundless, and its shapes, which come from out of nothing, simply stare at you and then go. The closest thing to words is the rain. In flowing sentences it falls, comes to a standstill in the trees, stutters consonants onto the leaves, gurgles dark vowels through the runnels, and when one drips into the other, a gust of wind suddenly spits through the foliage and raises slight ripples, rips the mist apart and bewilders the reeds. In all of this, still, you hear my voice. You're crouched on top of the tree stump, umbrella in front of your face, shoulders hunched, your fingers stuck into the pillow of moss along the roots. Or is it the plant that's sticking to your finger, a secret caress somehow tender? The film on the leaves feels greasy, like the drops you wiped out of your pajama bottoms this morning. You give the feeling the color white. White these mornings with Marga at the pond. Her bathrobe, the steam in the ditches, the uncertain light between the tree trunks, and a reflection on the water, which at first is brown, then clear with the rising of the sun. When you were still a child, you had to think of cola, a deep hole of it, where the old alder branch pokes into the water and stubbornly pushes something down. You wondered what it would be like to drown there in the brown soda-like water. But the tree never moved, nothing ever came up. And now you're thirteen, and even when the noontime sun stands high in the sky, the water there is black, grim, and secretive, just like the dream this morning from which Marga woke you. You were naked and out dangerously deep. You weren't able to glean anything else before she took the blanket away from you, and your glance, just like every morning, fell upon the large wall clock where an egg yolk yellow moon used to smirk before. As a birthday gift, she painted it over with the blood-red head of a darter dragonfly. Her first assault on your childhood. Now, instead of a benevolent goodnight face, there is a predatory insect that measures your dreams from the compound eyes of the clock face, which at that moment showed a little past seven. The room still dark, summer definitely over. She pressed a sleep-smelling kiss to your forehead and said, Good morning, darling. Shall we go to the pond? You look at your wristwatch. Almost half past seven already. In forty minutes, German class begins and you have to give your presentation. The topic? Dragonflies. You would have happily practiced it once again with your mother. She's standing in her nightgown on the bank, the damp silk showing off the curves of her body, her breasts, hip bones, the bumps of her spine as if beneath a second skin. She strips off everything, calls, Look at the alders, and throws you the crumpled gown. You put your hand out, an automatic movement, uncountable mornings rehearsed in all wind and weather. You can even do it in your sleep, and do as sleepiness comes and cripples your eyes which for just a second too long sink deep into the nest between her thighs, which, when throwing, she turns to you but at the same time hides, one arm half-stretched, the other bent over her lap like two timidly unfolding wings. When a dragonfly nymph molts for the final time, you say in your presentation, its new body is still foreign to it. The moment comes to you in slow motion like that morning, when waking up, you looked at the wooden clock and the second hand on the insect didn't seem to move and then suddenly jumped to the next number. Her night count smacks you cold in the face and you wake with a start. Every day she gets undressed in front of you, but only now do you understand why you were always supposed to look up into the trees. She's moving her arms in circles, stretching her back, already standing with her feet in the water. You're shivering from the neck down, then suddenly feel a burst of heat upon your cheeks. The way she presents her nakedness to you, 
Your eyes rush to the other bank. The alders everywhere. They encircle the entire pond. It's only by the splintered branch that you pause. In the dream, you now remember. It was here that you were underwater, trapped in the bubbling darkness, and when you tried to call for help, the beat sunk into your mouth. From inside you, your body began to swell against your skin, and then began to split. But the branch must have jerked you back up, and you opened your eyes. Too late, she was already holding you in her hand. You pushed her away and turned into the crevice between the wall and the mattress. Your erection felt different, harder, demanding. It wasn't as accidental as yesterday when, still asleep, you climbed up the steep peak and were awoken by the sudden feeling of pressure. Even the dragonfly on the clock seemed redder somehow, furtive, the mandible seemingly awaiting the next jerk of the second hand to shoot out. Marga was bent over you. You could feel her weight on your neck and could smell her bath oil. Lavender, her so-called well-being scent, the one she lounges about until midnight. You could barely breathe, air damming up about your collar, the moistness setting loose smells from deeper layers of skin, the bitter sleep sweat which came from her pills, the traces of perfume and gold smoke, and beneath them something sour, stagnant, something from a binge the night before or left over from the pond. You closed your eyes again in order to make more space for yourself. You were wishing yourself back to sleep when she took your hand and pushed it to her belly button, and further below, the hair. Softer than cotton grass, but more bristly than the moss at the tree stump. Last night, she said, she had dreamt that she was once again pregnant with you. You imagine the gnarled umbilical scar with the grass cleft below it as the entrance to an air bladder filled with more water that was about to pump out a mute, slippery thing. You. Dion, the pliable boy with a strange name thanks to which you've only received mockery and laughter. The stork, it brings all little babes, all except Dion, whom the more made, was how the saying went. The one that met you mornings when you stumbled into the kindergarten from the pond, past the other mothers, you, rain-soaked and with dirty shoes, past those mothers who had made sure to wrap up their sons and daughters dry and warm. Aren't I enough for you, Marga answered, when you once again asked about your father. In point of fact, you don't resemble any man in the village. You almost don't even resemble your mother. She is fair-haired, while your hair is more brown and tinged with red. And you have freckles around your nose, which, in August, your birth month, bloom in time with the heather, there, upon your sallow, somewhat slack skin, which remains pale whether summer or winter. Your skin which can't handle any heat at all, and like the morning fog, literally threatens to dissolve with any bit of sun. Marga's eyes reflect the sky in greys and cobalt blues. Yours, instead, are always searching the dark pools for dragonflies. The ones that must rise to the light to shed. Even your language comes from me. Gorbach, your teacher, was the first to make you aware of that, that day when your lips produced only a blubbering sound as you tried to read aloud from your book. Dumb as a dirty pool of water, he groaned and called next. The others giggled. Benno, who sat next to you, read effortlessly, while under your tongue the saliva simply backed up, a dripping and dribbling, just like in the hidden rivulets of the water channels where the water rises and sinks but never flows. When reading aloud at oral exams, and when giving presentations, the words well up in your mouth, gather into long flowing sentences that burst into the world in little bubbles of spit, and write into your stammering and your desire for a different and harmless language, one without any sound or sharp edges, soft and immaculate, like the morning stillness at the pond. You come out of your thoughts with a start. She's already in up to her thighs, splashing and wrapping her arms around her chest. The introduction to her rain pantomime, as you call this quotidian drama in your journal. You know what comes next as well as you do your presentation, which, you gather by looking at your watch, in less than half an hour must come out of your head and onto your tongue and from there into the world. If she had at least asked you just once about your presentation. 
She pointed to the window and pulled on your arm, as she always does when she wants you to do something for her. Cut the grass, write to the agency, massage her back for her while she's in bed, nights when she comes back from a workshop in knots from staring and making her strokes. Couldn't I stay home, you wanted to ask, and already choked on couldn't. The letters C and K have always been among your worst enemies. The latter so spiky, four edges and a sharp blade. And in its vicinity, the D already, which comes out so fat and round, it almost sticks in your throat. The sounds of K and D at the beginning and end of couldn't turned into a hopeless slaughter in your mouth and annihilated any combat-ready vowels to follow. You just swallowed it whole and went silent before even reaching the end. When those sounds, those letters march together, there's nothing to do but lay down your arms. Just think, for example, of when you have to pronounce your own name. Dion Kathusen. A massacre when Marga is not at home and you have to answer the phone. You only survive those rounds of introductions at the beginning of the school year or at confirmation class through the help of the letter H in the middle of your last name, which allows you to get a breath of air and win a little time because it's almost invisible, or rather soundless, soft and light as the wind through the bristly rushes. When talking, you think a moment about all the words, envelop the debris of your thoughts, which only through great effort come into rank and file, syllable and sentence. Say, Dion, a cut and couldn't I stay? Your speech dissipates into vagueness and vapor. Whatever you want dissolves. You're not even sure who you are. You wander through the world with your secret like an aimlessly wandering fog bank across the deceitful water landscape. It's no wonder, Dion, that everyone asks what it is you've got to do with me. Only a mother can understand her stuttering child. You didn't even need to finish. I'll take care of it for you, she said, and with her hand pointed half to you and half out of the window, a gesture embracing nothing and at the same time enveloping everything. You, the house, the village, the deep sky, the barn with all those useless paintings, a job in Hamburg, and yesterday, which you still didn't want to forgive her for. You walked embarrassedly past her and looked out to me, to the rain, whispering at the window pane. She really thinks your presentation is just an essay you have to read. She doesn't seem to hear your stutter, or does, but isn't bothered by it. Day and night she sees your pain and struggles, and is happy all the same to have a son who doesn't blather and complain all the time. From out of a hundred kids, she once said, and put her finger on your spastic mouth, she'd recognized you immediately. But she lied, Dion. The truth is that among a hundred children you are lost. Just having to say the name of your presentation, which Gorbach, thinking to be of help, had written on the board, The Life Cycle of Dragonflies, in front of the twenty others in your class, literally leaves you speechless. A groan of annoyance emerged from the rose, and from all the way back, David Voss piped up and called, Isn't it written with an H in the middle? A quarter to eight. She is now by the alder with the trunk that has been split into three, the run-down one with the already withering leaves, the one which must have once had four limbs, like arms and legs, before lightning struck one of the boughs and it had fallen into the water. In a moment she'd turn onto her back and swim just a little bit further until she came below the dead arms in which you've always seen the fingers of a hand. Then she'll turn again and look into the depths. Every morning you ask yourself what she's looking for in those elongated seconds under the alder claw where she has stopped moving and slowly begun to sink until her head goes in and you on your stump have to hold your breath. Only when the sun comes over the horizon line and the light breaks the mirror of the pond does she come back up and are you able to breathe. But today you hope and look once again to the clock. Thirteen to eight you think, and undo the buckles on your knapsack. She's already at the branch, and today, Dion, your childhood is definitely over. The water no longer holds any images. The pond is as voiceless as your life, which for far too long now hasn't received any air. There aren't any claws, no alder ghosts. 
There is no whispering in the rushes, no muttering in the wind. And the idea that you look like me is just plain nonsense. The color of your hair, your freckles, and your more brown eyes all come from your father. And your name, how could it be otherwise, you received from your mother. No one is talking when you listen to me. In reality, I am as silent as a fish, but there are no fish to be found here in these ponds. Only nightmares and horror stories, dead things that do not dissolve in the acidic water. Here where the dragonflies lay their eggs. So get up and take your goddamn presentation in your hand. She'll be swimming back to the bank where you're standing with the umbrella any minute and will be waiting for you to hand her her towel, the best chance for you to scream, not stutter, into her face, all that I have been whispering to you. And then, even in front of the class, there'll be no stopping you. You cowards, you'll yell in a razor-sharp voice, you chicken shits, listen to me. All their mouths will drop open and David Voss, your arch-enemy, will hide behind Thorst and Hinrich. For what you have to say will become a storm, no, a hurricane, and shall howl down and annihilate everything in its way. Marga is gone. You jump up and toss aside the umbrella, which slides into the pond. Mom! You yell. Panic has no edges. Your scream as flat and smooth as a bullet. A teal becomes frightened and flies off into the moor. From the distance you can hear its laughter. You run into the reeds, stop and begin to sink. See nothing under the branch but the deep. The pain of having let her out of your sight, of having lost her forever, is like a cut through your body. You tear yourself away and move from alder to alder. The trees play with your fear, push it away and gather it back up. Every trunk shows you another image of the pond at times, a puddle, at times a roaring sea. Every trunk shows you another image of the pond. At times a puddle, at times a roaring sea, first a bottomless pit, then a blazing light into which you dive and fall. In your falling you see the empty house below you, the open porch door, the laundry hung up on the line, the ashtray on the table that she always forgets to empty until the wind blows the butts away, the barn, the puttied window, the holes in the roof. You don't know how to repair it, nor where you'll have to bring all the junk, her pictures where, when she's dead, you'll have to order the coffin, who to call, who'll stand next to you at the grave, support you when you throw the rose. But, it occurs to you, she's always hated roses, and once, together, you secretly poured turpentine on Ilse Block's bushes. You run back to the stump. You hope you've only missed her, not seen her in the confusion of the bushes, that you'll see her shadow begin to rise in the water and be able to think of words of remorse and renewed loyalty. But the pond stays smooth and hard, a mirror. You fall onto your knees. The pond seeps into your shoes, a soft, almost comforting feeling. With bleeding eyes, you look over to the branch with the water silent below it. The image I'm showing you has never been as empty and truthful as it is just now.